we have been trapped in a universe where the speed of light is painfully slow. Yes, you know, it's fast by human standards, but it's not fast enough for intergalactic travel. The nearest galaxy is 2 million light years away. Who's going to survive that trip? So if we think there's, uh, certainly if there's extraterrestrial space travel, you have to have, you have to have shortcuts through space. And that's exactly what this movie's about. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Philosophers Movie Talk Show. I'm Chris Bush. And I'm Dean Slider. On the Philosophers, we talk about film and philosophy with the people who make and who love the movies. And on today's show, we are delighted to have as our guest, Professor John Hagelin, renowned quantum physicist and particle astrophysicist, president of Maharishi International University and head of the National Transcendental Meditation Organization, uh, John, in addition to being an esteemed scientist, is also a, an expert in consciousness and its development and a film buff in his own right. So we've invited John to join us on this show, which is dedicated to films on space travel. And this is a science fact or science fiction episode. And John will help us debunk, validate or debunk the science in three great sci space travel movies of the last 10 years which include 2013's Gravity with George Clooney and Sandra Bullock, 2014's Interstellar, directed by Christopher Nolan with Matthew McConaughey and Anne Hathaway, and 2015's The Martian, Ridley Scott's film with Matt Damon. So, John, are you ready to put your science hat on? And Well, it's fun to be with you. Just don't talk too fast to me. I'm a hexoseptogenarian. I can only think so fast. <laughs> uh, we're going to start with uh, the 2013 film Gravity in which uh, George Clooney and Sandra Bullock is um, space station doctors or, or space travelers on an orbiting space station are hit by space debris and have to abandon ship. Um, tell us a little bit just about the kind of your, your appreciation of the film from a scientific uh, point of view. I enjoyed the film a lot. The, you know, the photography, the special effects are pretty spectacular, beautiful views of the earth. Um, you know, it wasn't far off of reality. They did correctly depict aspects of what it would be like out there. In other respects, not so much. I mean, one little thing, for example, is yes, you can get hit by space debris. There's a lot of it, debris. There's a lot of it up there. But you really wouldn't see it coming, hitting you, and then bouncing away. You know, it's going to be, if it's going to hit you at all, it's going to be hitting you at speeds that are multiples of a rifle speed bullet. Yes, the, the, the speed at which things travel out there are typically 100 times the speed of a rifle bullet. So if you're going to get a hit, you're not going to see it coming and uh, you're not going to see it going. So that's a nitpick. It would certainly be rather devastating if you were hit. So that was real and it does happen. But that one little detail may have been, I mean, of course, if they filmed it the way it really would be seen, you wouldn't have much to look at. So of course they took some, we say artistic licentious when it came to that. <laughs> but, you know, it's pretty true. I, would, I think one thing that comes to mind that I thought was the, the ho hokiest part, and so key to the plot, near the beginning, George Clooney basically uh, sacrifices himself to save the woman, Sandra Bullock. He does so because they're held together by rope, and they're somehow getting pulled apart in a way that was kind of unrealistic in the sense that they're co-drifting in space. There's nothing pulling them apart. They're moving together, they're mm. floating together. There's nothing that's gonna have him have to just release a rope and then suddenly disappear into the distance. So that was kind of, I think, a, a mischaracterization of what it's like to be co-drifting in space, but it was necessary for the plot. So I suppose we can forgive them that oversight. And there are a few others, I think, if I scratch my memory, but- um, I, I, I think that, that particular moment, interesting for, for me, uh, uh, recalled, and that's, as you point out, John, you know, near the beginning of Gravity, at the end of Titanic, that's, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet on, floating on that little piece of debris, and, and Leo realizing that it can't hold the both of them and sacrificing himself. Yeah. 
So it's, I like the movie, but you know, it's more, I would say that's more drama than science fiction. There wasn't a lot of science in it. Um, you know, it, it, the fact that she was able to rocket that, I guess it was Chinese uh, vessel home uh, unaided and survive it and land. I mean, you know, it wasn't terribly realistic, but it was good space drama, if not, uh, you know, uh, a sophisticated science fiction film. Maybe. And, and John, as you point out, beautifully shot. And the thing I loved about it, especially in the opening several minutes, was the, the, real, the, the kind of balletic movement of the camera, of the point of view. Uh, you know, it's really, uh, it's really three, you know, it, it's the George Clooney character and the Sandra Bullock character and the camera, the point of view that are doing this just lovely, graceful dance together. And in fact, it's the first, I think, um, 12 minutes is presented as one shot, no cuts. Of course, you know, that's done the, these days with technical magic. It's not really a continuous shot, but it's presented as that. And, it's, and at one point, the point of view, the camera actually swings back into Sandra Bullock's helmet. So we're looking out through her helmet and seeing, you know, the projections of the, you know, in yeah. red of this, the numbers she needs to see. And then we yes. move out of that. And it's, it's, no. it, it's really- It was beautifully done. I remember that. I thought the way they did that, the motion, that whole space of motion and spinning and all that was marvelously done and really quite gripping. It was beautiful and very engaging. Yep. For and the so audience, if, oh, go ahead, Dean. Yeah, and from and the, from uh, the point of view of the 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 element of consciousness, there's you know there is a lovely thing that happens, uh, where there's a moment where San, the Sandra Bullock character looks down to the surface of the earth and she sees a storm, a hurricane, and she's looking into the eye of the hurricane, which of course that's the still point in the middle of all the tumult which of course is what, as meditators, as spiritual aspirants, that's what our life is all about. And it is exactly halfway through the film. Interesting. That's, so that still point, that center point is exactly in the center point of the film. That's interesting. I don't know whether that's coincidence or intentional, but you know, that, that vortex structure is the way that the you know, founder of Transcendental Meditation in our generation, Marshi Mashyogi, Describe the transcendent. Describe the transcendent as the still point at the center of the vertex around which the active activities of consciousness swirl. It was beautiful. I didn't really see it in that light when I saw it, but it it, it is true what you're saying, and that might have been an intentional metaphor. I'll I'll bet I'll bet money it was intentional, because there's one thing other thing that he does that's actually hilarious. If you blink, you miss it. It's um. Actually, I think this is 12 minutes in. I think, I think I got my numbers mixed up. I think that unbroken shot is 23 minutes long and it's tw 11 or 12 minutes in. There's a moment where the, the camera, the point of view is passing, uh, the, I forget now if it's his helmet or her helmet, and you see the reflection of the camera and the camera crew for half a second in their helmet as if there's a camera there really out in space rather than in front of a green screen in a studio and there's a camera crew floating in zero g along with them so in other words it's a deliberately manufactured blooper yeah it's clever the way hollywood will occasionally do that i think it's kind of an inside joke i don't know if it's meant to yes. be caught by many people but you're a philosopher after all <laughs> and i expect that you and uh Chris are going to pick up on things this that is, I did. This, this, is, this is what we get paid for. The big bucks. I, I didn't the notice big, that. The, but I, 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 what really just what I appreciated and just thought was so beautiful too, for those that want, choose to revisit the film, is the play of light and shadow during that whole sequence as they're moving around in space and, you know, as effectively as the sun is, 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 is casting different contours of light and shadow on them and uh, it's just it must. I mean, it must have been all storyboarded out with computer uh, modeling because uh, it, it, it's so specific and and uh, I would imagine you know photorealistic. Uh, 
so that was beautiful but but that that's that is the the mention of you know skepticism about Sandra Bullock being able to manage that flight home unaided in a Chinese vessel with and 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 without any uh, suggestion that she speaks Mandarin um I guess I guess we can forgive it because Sandra Bullock after all did survive a a um uh, a, 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 a bus trip with Keanu Reeves and it was strapped to a bomb. So she could do that. My she God. Can, oh yeah. She can, she can do anything. One was other... she in that film, sorry, with a bus suddenly sprung into the air and leapt over a giant gap. Yeah. Let's talk yeah. about the physics of Speed. that, of that scene. Speed. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't. Maybe Speed. we should yeah. just get me mad. <laughs> okay. Well, one other point about the physics of, of the film gravity, um, uh, which is, you know, space films, very often they'll take the artistic license of representing, uh, having the, the people f floating in space, hearing sounds. And of course, there is okay. no transmission of sound in space because there's no atmosphere for sound waves to travel through. What if you pay close attention, the only sounds you hear when they're out in space are the things that they would feel in their when there's like impact when they knock against the surface of the vessel and it's impact that they sound essentially that they would feel through their bones rather than get through their ears. The, yeah, the that's, that's true. They all, all the space movies do that. It's just not much of a score, I suppose, if you're really hearing the silence of space when they're in their craft. Of course, it's different. Yeah. Then if something hits the craft, you will hear it. You know, through the air in the actual spacecraft. If something strikes their suit or their helmet, uh, they'll hear it because there is uh, air in the helmet. But you're right, that's that's a common mistake. I think it's an intentional mistake just because you know, we as human beings need to be hearing something when we're watching. Let me ask you a question real quick about space debris. There's there's so much of it up there. I mean, you see these these uh, dig these maps that plot out all the different satellites and and items floating through in space, orbiting at different altitudes. And how do the, how do the, how does NASA prevent, um, you know, th collisions or problems with the, the people who are in the orbiting space stations? That's a very good question, Chris. Um, you know, there is a lot of space junk up there, but um, let me put it this way. If you look at the map of the airplanes in the sky, airplanes in our atmosphere, there are a lot of those too. And you think you'd have many, many more plane collisions than we have. The thing about the sky is that it's, it's, it's big. And secondly, <laughs> there are layers of it. So if all of those planes were on the highway and were on the, on the surface of the earth, you probably would have multiple collisions. But the fact that they are separated by 500 feet all the way up to 1,000, 10,000, 20,000 feet, 30,000, 40,000 feet, you've got 80 different layers of airplanes and they're carefully sticking to their layers and therefore not often colliding with each other. In space, there's a lot of debris and it's moving fast, but oh my God, is there a lot of space. <laughs> there you have satellite orbits that might be a hundred miles off the ground, 101 miles off the ground, 102 miles off the ground, all the way up to 18,000 miles off the ground. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole lot of vertical space to fill. So um, the actual density or, you know, the density of space debris is not as much nearly as it's going to look like if you take a picture of it and flatten the picture. So there's that third dimension that you can have to basically miss each other. That said, you know, there are collisions in space. There is too much debris. There's not no one really controlling that, um, especially when you get close to the atmosphere. That's when all the low Earth orbit stuff, where all the low Earth orbit stuff is. And it's pretty crowded there. And there you just have to hope that uh, it will all soon come down. And it is, it's constantly filtering down, starting to hit a little bit of air, then a little more air. And as soon as it hits an appreciable amount of air, it starts to slow down much more quickly. And then it crashes to the ground, sometimes with a streak of light, but the number of debris, the debris that actually hit the earth are very small. Unless it's a very big piece, it'll burn up on the way down. So there's a natural purifying or cleansing mechanism going on in the low earth orbit stuff. And if you're going to the higher Earth orbit stuff, then you have got a lot more vertical space to spread out all the space junk. So that's why collisions are more frequent than they are, but they do happen. I remember years ago when Skylab was making its descent in the Earth's atmosphere, and I think people were sleeping under their beds. That was a fun moment. Yeah. yeah. yeah.
Don't look up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to move along to the 2015 Ridley Scott film, The Martian. And this, uh, just to give viewers uh, a setup if they have not seen it, uh, there's a Martian space, uh, Martian colony, and there's a violent Martian storm that threatens the, uh, the colony. And they're given orders to abandon the mission and get off that planet pronto. Well, in the storm, one of our heroes is, uh, uh, is, is, is pulled away by the storm. He loses his comms. They can't reach him. He's presumed dead. They, the rest of them take off. Well, it turns out he's not dead at all. And not only that, he's Matt Damon. So, so now Matt is stranded, marooned on Mars with no prospect of an early retrieval. And that's kind of the setup for the film. So, uh, and it was beautifully made, I thought. And I don't know how scientific realist, scientifically realistic it was. And we're going to find out now as our esteemed physicist John Hagelin separates fact from bogosity. <laughs> okay, the coefficient of bogosity in this particular film is low. There's an awful lot about it that is realistic. The central premise, I don't want to, spoiler, maybe spoiler alert, I will say, is the crew is on their way home having left their beloved comrade behind alive. They finally find that out. They're already halfway back to Earth, which is a multi-month trip. And there's no other spacecraft really ready, prepared to go out and rescue this person, which would be you know, a multi-billion dollar rescue, certainly multi-hundred million dollar rescue effort for one person. I don't know what, frankly, NASA would actually do in such, such a circumstance. Yeah, but, it, but, it's, but it's Matt Damon. <laughs> well, he's, that's true. He's yeah. worth a lot. <laughs> that's true. Somehow or other, it gets out that the guy is alive. And NASA wasn't sure whether to announce that to the public because it would create such a firestorm. What do we do? And how do we leave him behind? And what are we going to do to save him? And, but you know, it, it got out. And um, they had to do something. And they decided they were going to attempt a rescue. Or actually, they don't think they were sure what they were going to decide. But bottom line was, the most expeditious rescue would be for this crew to actually themselves go back and rescue their buddy, not by putting on the brakes, and they're already traveling at seven or eight miles a second towards home, and then using rockets to turn around and go the other way. They were gonna use the earth as a slingshot mechanism. They were gonna use the earth's gravity and also the earth's motion through space, harnessing both the gravity of the earth and the, the rate of motion of the earth to sling the spaceship back around and head it towards Mars, where it would take very little, if any, rocket fuel in order to get back. And once on Mars, I guess in principle, you would orbit a slingshot around Mars uh, after picking up the person and slinging back home. That's all viable. I mean, if they're lucky and the Earth is in the right place at the right time to serve as a slingshot to get them zipping back to Mars, and if Mars is in the right place, which is sometimes the case and sometimes not, it would work. So that whole basic premise is, is viable. And an awful lot about the film was really quite, quite accurately viable. It's a very well done space adventure. I think there were some oddities to it. I don't know if any come to mind that you have questions. Uh, otherwise I'll try and dredge some up, Chris. You know, a lot of the film centers around Matt Damon's uh, ingenuity and creativity to um, survive. Uh, months on the planet with dwindling rations and how he has to create self-sufficiency to wait for the return of a crew, which he has no certainty of at the beginning of the film. And that includes um, uh, planting eyes of potatoes in, in Martian soil and cultivating them, fertilizing them and generating a water source. And, and, and nurturing them with his own poo. Yeah, that's the... Nourishment source. I'm glad, Dean, you did uh, remind me of that uh, yeah. aspect of the film. So, is that is that scientifically viable? Well, you know, I had to actually check into some aspects of that myself. You know, the atmosphere on Mars is very, very rarefied. It only has, I think, a half a percent, maybe a percent of the density of air here on Earth, and of course, a human being can't breathe, breathe 
or live in an atmosphere that is 1% of the density of the air on Earth, there wouldn't be enough oxygen for us to live on. And in fact, the atmosphere of Mars doesn't have any oxygen to begin with to speak of. It's mostly carbon dioxide. And so, of course, we all know you can't live on Mars if you're a human being without oxygen. I was wondering whether you could grow potatoes on Mars with, because of the lack of air. And it turns out, from that perspective at least, you could, because although there's very little air on planet Mars, most of it is carbon dioxide. And that's, of course, what plants breathe. And they basically burn carbon dioxide, if you wish, plus sunlight. And they turn that into carbohydrates, which they store, and they breathe out oxygen, which humans could breathe if we were there to breathe it. So that standpoint of being able to grow plants on the surface of Mars, I think is sound. Um, you have to deal with the very low temperatures. Uh, at least most of the year on Mars, and certainly most of the planet's surface on Mars is well below freezing, and that's a problem as far as plants are concerned. So if I'm not mistaken, Matt Damon creates an indoor uh, garden uh, in a bubble, and in that bubble, he keeps it warm, and in the bubble, he also creates uh, water through burning some of the leftover, some of the extra rocket fuel. And yes, when rocket fuel burns, carbon dioxide is one of the byproducts of that, usually. Um, water vapor is a byproduct of that. And in principle, you could wring the water vapor out of the air. You can get it to condense and you could use it to feed plants, you know, like with a water dropper with, you know, you could do it. So I think the basic premise is, could we farm on Mars? Could we have a colony on Mars, a tented colony in which we farm? And I think the answer is yes. If you can warm the tent, uh, I've got plenty of carbon dioxide, which is what the plants breathe. Uh, if you have a supply of water or a supply of rocket fuel, I guess you could burn and turn into water. You probably are okay, okay on that score. There were other things that troubled me, but the very idea of growing plants on Mars seems sound now that I know how much carbon dioxide there is in the little bit of atmosphere you do have. John, I watched some commentary on this film by some NASA scientists, and, and like you, they were very positively impressed with most of the science. Two things they pointed out. One is that because of the scant atmosphere on Mars, the, the, the monster dust storm that creates the problem at the beginning of the film could not happen. It, and that's, I think that's a, a viable complaint. Mars does have high-speed windstorms. You, you can have windstorms with winds that are 600 miles an hour on the surface of Mars. But even though that's a lot of speed, the density of the atmosphere is as thin as it is, may not kick up the dust that they show in the movie. It, it might be enough to, um, I, I don't think it'd be enough to blow the rocket ship over either because 600, of course, 600 mile an hour winds are more than, her category five hurricanes much. Right. But if there's no weight behind the wind, if the atmosphere is mostly you know, emptiness, yep. it probably wouldn't have blown the ship over. That's a very good, that didn't occur to me at the time, but that is a very good. Yeah, to, yeah, that, that's what they said. There, what, there wouldn't be sufficient inertia to the, to the atmosphere there to do that. The, the other thing they said is just more of a question mark is the fact that uh, Mars gravity is 38% that of Earth gravity. And that were so that Matt should have looked much lighter on his feet uh, as he was walking around the surface. Um, you know, on the other hand, he was wearing a spacesuit, so maybe that 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 would have weighed him down a little bit. But what the NASA scientists said actually is that we're very familiar with uh, the physics and also the biology, how how our body behaves in. 100% gravity, that is Earth gravity, we're very familiar with how it is in zero, zero Gs up in space, but we're not very familiar with the effects of gravity in between. So, so some of that is guesswork. Yes, I imagine so, but by extrapolation, and of course we've had people walking on the moon and then you get used to a different way of striding so that you actually can move farther and easier. 
And I would think that if we can survive, uh, not easily, but we can survive in zero gravity for quite a long time and with rigorous, you know, simulated exercises and such, I would think the exercise you would get on, on the moon or on Mars, which is stronger than the moon, mm -hmm. would be, you know, sufficient to maintain yourself with a little bit of attention and effort. Yeah. So that's an interesting thought. It doesn't concern yeah. me so much. There's something strange that did happen in the movie. Um, and that is when the tent that housed the garden basically blew open due to some slightly not well explained mechanism. It just burst, the pressurized garden burst. And in that pressurized garden, if I'm not mistaken, my memory might fail me. Um, Matt Damon was in there farming and I don't think he had his suit on when he was in that all the time. I'd have to double check that. He was actually in his suit outside of the, of the living facility, I think, when that, when that catastrophic event took place. Right. And he, and he came back in through, uh, maybe the airlock had been, it was preserved, I'm not sure, but he was able to come back in and observe to see all of his plants destroyed and much yes. of the, the, the living, living quarters trashed. Yes, but when he was inside, the healthy functioning garden, the indoor garden. Was he wearing his suit indoors or did he shed his suit? Indoors? No, not when he was indoors. Okay. But the, so but that's the, I think the, the catastrophic event happened when he was outside in his suit, I think. Yes. Okay. But my complaint with that is this. After the um, thing blew up, he repaired it. He took some plastic bag material and some duct tape and he blocked a hole in the tent, which is about the size of maybe five feet by five feet hole in the tent with plastic bag material and duct tape so that he could have a pressurized garden again. But you know, to get a pressurized garden, let's just say it's gonna be fully pressurized to have the air density of planet Earth. There's a huge amount of air pressure involved in that. You know, if you want to live in a garden without your spacesuit on, you've got to have air pressure comparable to Earth's air pressure that we're born, that we're grown up in, that we're used to breathing. So there's a lot of air pressure on the surface of the Earth. And you're not going to be able to seal, seal a tent with duct tape. The amount of air pressure is about, you know, 14 pounds per square inch. So if you have something that's 10 inches by 10 inches, that's a 1,400 pounds of pressure on a 10 inch by 10 inch square of tent. And if you go to a, you know, let's say a 10 foot by 10 foot or five foot by five foot square hole, and you want to tape that up on that piece of cellophane and on your duct tape, you're going to have many, 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 many tons of pressure, which would cause that cellophane to burst and the duct tape to obviously fall off. So patching up a tent like that and trying to maintain livable air pressure cannot be done with duct tape. It can be done with steel, but not with duct tape. So that was, I had to see that part again, but that struck me as a, a bogoid, a technical bogoid in the middle. Right, John, mm -hmm. John, of course, what you're saying from the point of view of science makes perfect sense. But I have to say here that just as an article of religious faith, I'm convinced that you can do anything you need to do with duct tape or WD-40. But there's something to that. You can fix anything with a hammer too. Yeah. But John, that seems to be a really pretty serious uh, feasibility breach. And I'm just a little surprised you're not, you're not more enraged at the filmmakers <laughs> for that transgression. <laughs> and what do you think would be a suitable punishment for them? <laughs> Well, corporal punishment certainly is appropriate in a situation like this. Um, well, you know, there was so much about the movie that was right. Yeah. I was quite impressed. Yeah. Um, in, in, you know, it was a well thought movie. Including, you know, when they're, when they're up in their, their, their uh, uh, space uh, station uh, that we're talking before about the effects of gravity on the body and that, that it's well known that the biological effects of prolonged exposure to zero G does nasty things to the body. So they've got that big wheel shaped uh, part of the, the, sh the ship. I think this goes back to 2001 and it's constantly rotating to produce artificial gravity. So to, to keep the, the, the bodies healthy. 
And that is the way real space missions are designed and conceived of these days. If there's a Mars mission, that's a pretty long flight. It might be a ship of that nature. Anything, you know, to Jupiter or beyond you, I think people are conceiving of those happening in a ship with a rotating element to it that would provide the artificial gravity to help keep people healthy and happy longer. Is that what, like an eight or nine month voyage? Is that right? Or is it longer? Um, yes, uh, it really depends on the time of year you launch, but you choose a, an optimal time to commence a journey like that. And you can afford to wait an extra year if you need to, to be able to cut the journey time from what might be several years to, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine months. And so that will depend on the timing. Of course, Mars will be easier than Jupiter. Jupiter quite a bit easier than Saturn. Uh, yeah, they time it that way. And um, you can do those journeys probably to Mars in principle in say six months, uh, if you time it right. So is, and is that, um, is that gonna happen anytime soon? Is there kind of realistic planning for such a voyage? Are Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos going, I hope? Elon Musk is seriously planning on it. And there's a whole, you know, there's a whole space docudrama that he, I think, produced that has to do with a real mission to Mars. Now, they made a story out of it, and there's disasters in it, and there's all kinds, because otherwise, you know, it's a slow story as you wait months and months for people to attempt the journey. Um, no, I do think that there is uh, having humans travel to Mars is on the books. I don't think there's a scheduled date for it. I think there's a lot more planning that has to be done, but it's the next major frontier in terms of human space travel. We might go to the moon again, just because you know we've done it and we know we can do it again and just to keep the, get the juices flowing again and make sure we have, we're back on our game. Mars is the next you know, significant destination for humans. And um, I don't know, I think they're talking about a 30 year time frame. Yeah, we'll see, of course. So let's move on to our third film uh, under discussion. And this is the uh, 2014 film by uh, visionary director Christopher Nolan called Interstellar, starring Matthew McConaughey and Anne Hathaway. And this is more speculative science. Uh, it just quickly, for context, it revolves around the story of an Air Force pilot, um, Matt McCon Matthew McConaughey, who's also a farmer during an apocalyptic uh, climate crisis and human life is in peril. He is led purportedly or seemingly to a uh, secret NASA facility where there are plans to launch a vehicle into space through a wormhole to a galaxy of unknown origin, I guess. And the wormhole was placed near, near the planet Saturn by some future race or alien race. And so Matthew travels through the wormhole uh, to scout out some planets that had been visited some years before by a, um, an advanced team, which included Matt Damon and some other space travelers. And, uh, then he 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 returns, but it's 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 a very kind of fantastical uh, method of returning in it. And and one of the concepts I wanted just to have you kind of discuss was he uses the force of gravity as a as a kind of language in which to communicate with the past. Is as it as if because gravity can transcend space and time, the language of gravity is used to communicate with the past. There are fantastical elements, including the wormhole. John, take it away and tell us a little bit your thoughts on Interstellar. Well, Interstellar is the most profound of the movies in, in terms of its ambition, uh, its scientific fiction ambition. And, and it is a very profound and relevant subject to explore. And that is not just space travel, but time travel. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But one of the things that that pleased me most about the movie is that Matthew McConaughey kept his shirt on. This may be the only movie I've ever seen him. He didn't take his shirt off. And I frankly have had you know, more than enough of that. So thank God for small favors. So basically, yes, it, it, the plot is that human civilization appears doomed. And the scientists in the know and the planetary scientists and the you know, weather 
experts knew that the days on Earth were numbered, that Earth was becoming a barren planet, unable to support agriculture. Um, so that was the problem. And the plot, basically, if I can just boil it down, is that, uh, how, how do I explain it? Is that the, in future times, the human race sends back a messenger back in time to basically save the planet Earth from destruction. So the Earth was headed for destruction. Somehow it evades destruction. And the, re the way it evades destruction is by basically sending back somebody from the future to basically tell the earth how to avoid the disaster. And that seems like a strange logic because if it was headed for destruction and couldn't be saved except for some visitor from the future of earth, someone from who, who survived and long into the distant future comes back to save the earth. Well, the civilization has already been wiped out. So how could somebody come back from the future to save the planet earth? But that's the wrong way to think about it. From that perspective, it all seems like nonsense. But think of it this way. Let's say the Earth somehow survives by the skin of its teeth, and, and, uh, but requiring some advice and some help, help on how to survive. And that help comes from the future, from someone who had survived. Is it possible? And the, the answer, you know, you might puzzle over it. And physicists have puzzled over that question for a long time. It is a question that can be answered in the context of what is called Einstein's general relativity, which is the theory of curved space and curved time, which is the correct theory of gravity. Of course, quantum gravity is the more advanced theory of gravity than Einstein's gravity, but Einstein's gravity is plenty good to understand this plot. In, I, in, it's a recent discovery, and these are difficult theoretical calculations, it has recently been confirmed that there are valid histories that are perfectly plausible in physics where a human being could indeed come back in time and talk to himself, uh, for example. And, uh, and that's all, coming back in time like that is, a, is possible in strongly curved spaces, like in the vicinity of a black hole or a wormhole. That's sort of what's called closed time loop is a valid solution to the physical equations of motion. It's a, it is a valid, plausible thing that can happen. Now, it all has to be logically consistent. You know, if you're gonna send somebody back in time, or let's say, if you're gonna go back in time and meet your father, and then you convince your father not to get married so that you're not born, you end up with kind of a problem. Because once you go back to the past time, you know, there you are, and there's your father, and your father never gets married, and therefore you're never born. That would be a logical and consistent example of what I'm talking about. But there are logically consistent examples of these time loops where you go back and you tell your father to get married. And John, someone gets married. John, I actually have a, an example. A, I actually am an example of a, a, this is a true story of what you're talking about. My father, during the Second World War, was the Captain Harris Slider, was the he piloted a B 17 Flying Fortress bomber over the European theater, flew a couple of dozen missions with the same crew, wiping out the, the German industrial capacity. One night was the night before a mission. This, it's the typical thing. You've seen it in a million World War II films. They go into the tent, they get their orders, they synchronize their watches, they go back to their bunks. My father goes back to his bunk. For some reason, some other guy is sleeping in his bunk. So not wanting to disturb the guy, my dad realizes he can go find a cot in the infirmary, which he does. The next morning, they're pulling the crew together for the mission. Someone says, where's the pilot? Where's Slider? Someone else says, 
oh, he's in the infirmary. There's a misunderstanding. They think he's sick. They go up with a different pilot. That's the day they're shot down out of the sky and everyone is killed. Therefore, I get to be born. True story. Now, I, it's been, I heard this story as a child, and this has been an enigma for me for my whole life. Who was the guy sleeping in the bunk? My, my theory is it's a, it's a future Dean Slider, that at some point I'm going to have to do some space travel through a wormhole or something so I can go sleep in that bunk so that I can be born. You know, that, that would be exactly the same as happened in the story. That is actually physically possible, as long as it's, you know, logically consistent. If you go back and you convince your father to get married, for example, in my version of the story, and he gets buried and gives birth to you, well... The kids, the baby's living, you're there living, probably a lot older than the baby, and you're stuck in that time. But at one point, you know, uh, that baby is going to have to come back and be you. And he, so these things actually probably happen. And actually, actually John, you're, you're describing essentially the plot of Back to the Future. <laughs> Perhaps. I don't remember that film so well. Yeah, where, um, uh, uh, what's his name? You know, the character, Michael Marty, J. Fox. Michael J. Fox, Marty McFly mm -hmm. goes, goes to, to the past where his future parents are in high school. And he realizes that because his father, his father is such a nerd, he's never going to get up the courage to, to get together with his future wife. And so, so, so Michael J. Fox basically has to play matchmaker so that he can be born. Yes, in that's interesting because I, I wasn't very old when that came out, didn't pay much attention to it. But that is, you know, as long as it's logically consistent, you know, that sort of backwards time travel can happen. And that was an unknown thing. A year ago, that was not known. It's only been shown relatively recently that that type of uh, closed time loop is an acceptable solution to Einstein's equations of motion in strongly curved spaces. So but you 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 mentioned that that would could happen within the proximity of a wormhole or a black hole, because the forces are such that well, however the gravity gravity is affected that that the you know time and space curves back on itself in that way. Yes. Could a human physiology withstand the uh, exposure to that proximity? Yeah, possibly, possibly yes, yes. Um, in this particular movie, there is a wormhole as a wormhole that basically is the strongly curved space time that we're talking about here, where the spaceship, you know, was able to traverse. If a wormhole is a big enough, you might be able to fit a spaceship through it. Maybe you could even fit a planet through it. I don't know how to make, nobody knows how to make a wormhole that big. We do know in principle how to make tiny wormholes in the laboratory, but really, really, really tiny, smaller than an electron could even fit through. Big wormholes, we don't know how to make. We don't even know if they can be made. But at least, you know, the mathematics of wormholes suggests that it's possible. Whether it's practically possible or not, we don't know. And a minor detail for the fans, traveling, traversing a wormhole is dangerous business. The wormholes that we do know how to make, the wormholes that are likely to exist in nature, are often non-traversable wormholes which means that you really can't, they may be tempting, you might be tempted to plunge in, but you do so at your own demise. The yeah, so, 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 keep, of death. so keep your shirt on. Exactly, right. So anyway, I, this is definitely a fanciful, you know, this visual image of coming back through time and, you know, the way it's depicted, it's quite fanciful. This is the most far out of these movies, but in a way it's one of the most, you know, intellectually challenging in a fashion that's actually consistent with the latest uh, cutting edge understandings of what might be possible. Practically, it's a different question. We don't know if any of this is practically possible, but at least in theory, the window is open for this kind of possibility. And I'll go so far as to say this, for any of your many, many fans who believe that there has been extraterrestrial visitations to the earth, either now or sometime in the past, whether any of the stories are true or any of the evidence is true. If you're a believer in 
um, extraterrestrial travel, then you are probably, you know, you have to believe in space-time wormholes. You have to believe in this sort of thing because there's no conventional technology that does not involve the curvature of space that's going to get somebody to the Earth from outside of our solar system. Even the nearest stars where you might have habitable planets, which might have advanced civilizations on them, you know, that's a journey of uh, many lifetimes in, in a rocket ship to get from there to here, even in the fastest uh, conventional rocket ships or any uh, rocket ship that we can currently conceive of. If you can't bend space, you can't short circuit the journey, we're not gonna have had extraterrestrial visitors. So those who believe in extraterrestrial visitors, and it's probably half of the audience, I, I, I you know, go back and forth on it myself. Um, and I've talked to some very high up people in our government who also you know, present mixed evidence. I must say it's the evidence seems to be somehow more mixed than I think uh, we would like. We wanted to feel confident that it has ever happened, but there is evidence of certain kind. If you believe in that, then you would have to say, okay, so this space-time travel, wormhole travel, time travel, it's possible. So, you know, there may be some evidence depending upon where you stand on the subject of extraterrestrial visitors to Earth, there may be very strong evidence for people who do believe there have been such visitations for this type of curb, space-time curvature and space-time travel, including time travel. So it's not as far out as it looks in the movie. For those who don't believe that there's been visitations to the earth, they could probably just dismiss the whole thing as probably impractical. For those who choose to believe in extraterrestrial visitors to the earth, you have to say, well, this is quite plausible because people have used it already to get here. There's no other way here. Uh, we have been given, we have been trapped in a universe where the speed of light is painfully slow. Yes, you know, it's fast by human standards, but it's not fast enough for intergalactic travel. The nearest galaxy is 2 million light years away. Who's going to survive that trip? So if we think there's, uh, certainly if there's extraterrestrial space travel, you have to have, you have to have shortcuts through space. And that's exactly what this movie's about. So an ET phones home, uh, he's not using um, digital he, or he needs, fiber optic needs, links. When, when ET phones home, he needs a lot of quarters. <laughs> that's right. Good, good. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, anyone listening to this who's under the age of, what, 30 or something has no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, it's fun listening to you guys. You guys really know a whole lot about film. And uh, I should, I'm inspired to watch more. Good. Well, yeah, you watch, watch Back to the Future. Actually, it's a lovely film. Uh, it's beautiful. It's funny on a humanistic level. It, it's lovely. I'm going to take this opportunity very briefly to to uh, vent my usual rage at um, Christopher Nolan that that because I think every film that he made after Memento on on in this, the conceptual level, the scientific, the technical grandiosity is is as you said hugely ambitious. But uh, his his understanding of of how human emotions work and how humans talk to each other uh, is um, he he needs. Uh, he and James Cameron are the two directors, I feel, because they're masters of technology, they think they can write scripts and they, they can't. Um, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the last, you know, there's whole like huge chunks of interstellar that to me sound like uh, college freshmen who've been taking astrophysics 101, they're back in the dorm, they've been hitting the bong, and they've been saying, oh yeah, so then if we could, but only in this case, their survival depends on one of them um, improbably coming up with the right answer. And I vent too on something now, I'm gonna date myself. I'm gonna prove that I'm a hexoseptogenarian here. But there was a television show when I was growing up called Lost in Space, which for a dumb kid was kind of a fun show. Well, they made a movie probably 25 or 30 years ago about lost in space. And they spent a whole lot of money on some, you know, pretty significant special effects for the time. The dialogue in that movie was so excruciatingly bad, even for an illiterate physicist like myself, 
I absolutely <laughs> couldn't stand. It. You know, there's so many movies that they just paid, you know, a college student 150 bucks could have come up with a script, a dialogue, so yeah. much better than what you'll see in this, you know, hundred million dollar film. You, you wonder sometimes why investors will invest in a high tech, expensive movie without bothering to hire a scriptwriter who could actually make the thing tolerable. Yeah, I was delighted to see Christopher Nolan's last film. I can't even remember its title, but Tenet. I was. What was it? Tenet. Tenet. Yeah, T yeah. I was delighted to see it tank because it was so grandiose and so stupid. So Dean, I will take a contrarian point of view that I think Christopher Nolan, you know, initially being quite a technical wizard like, like Cameron, he's, he's, the, he's a puzzle master and his movies um, uh, approach films, it, it kind of his intricate puzzles. And I, I appreciated films like Inception and The Prestige for that reason. And some of them I like, some of them I don't like, but I would add to that list, actually one who takes precedence over Christopher Nolan and um, James Cameron for me is George Lucas, who, although he created the wonderful, wonderful um, mythical world of, of Star Wars, when he made his his uh, second three of the films, the Phantom Menace. Starring Jar Jar Binks. Yeah, with Jar Jar Binks and, the, and the, those others. He didn't go to the trouble of getting a, a, a script writer, of getting any collaboration. Yep. And the, it was it was just George Lucas, and it was so bad. It, it was just, it, they, they were so bad. I, I Again, the guy- Unfortunately, it was. I mean, the storylines, I still loved in those, but you really had to block your ears when there was any dialogue going on. But was it not 10, who did the film a, a couple of years ago? about extraterrestrial visiting earth and these like big fat blobby ships that just sat there and hovered above the ground oh and that he, was a rival that was dennis villeneuve who just did do oh yes that was oh, yeah. a rival, that was a rival with that amy was. adams and jeremy renner and i love that movie did you see that it was, yeah Arrival? Um, no, I did not. Oh, oh, it's fantastic. She is a linguist and she's called in to try to decipher alien language. Mm. And it's really thought provoking. I thought that was marvelous. That was my one of my favorite sci-fi movies of recent times. I'm glad you mentioned that, John. John, we'll have to have you come back to talk about Dune and Arrival and other films. And, and really maybe films that, that uh, where we have the intersection of, of, of science fiction and science and consciousness would be fun to talk about. I'd love that. As long as I get top billing. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got it. Anyway, pleasure to be with you, gentlemen. I really appreciate the uh, joy. Uh, really quite fun to be with you today. And I love my homework assignment, which is to watch more science fiction movies. I'll get on that right away. <laughs> John, thanks for joining us. It's a real pleasure to have you on. My pleasure. Thank you for joining us on the Philosopher's Movie Talk Show. Please subscribe to stay up to date on our newest episodes.